Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Five Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. Coming up on this week's episode, Microsoft has launched Windows 11 version 24H2. Also, AT&T makes big claims about the percentage increase in cost of their VMware license renewal. And Office 365 accounts were used in a so-called hack-to-trade scheme that netted the perpetrators millions. For this and more, keep listening to this episode of the podcast, which of course, as always, is brought to you by my sponsors. And that includes Numescent, the inventors of the first and only cloud-native container management platform for Windows desktops. And of course, also brought to you by Master Packager, who make an application packaging software that helps you build packages that end users love, enterprises want, and the Windows OS needs. If you enjoy the show each week, you have these awesome sponsors to thank. And now for some news. This week, Windows 11 24H2 was launched by Microsoft. If you've listened to this podcast regularly, many of the new features in this release are features you'll already know about, as I covered them when introduced into the preview builds in the previous months, including the Windows sudo command, which is now available, enhancements to File Explorer that includes a visualization of the current file's location, the network connection icon in the system tray is said to now be more intuitive, Wi-Fi 7 support has been introduced, Bluetooth LE or low energy support is also introduced, and there is a new scrollable view for quick settings that makes it easier to customize the list of settings and more. For a full list, I'll share a link with this episode if you want to check it out for yourself, and you'll find that at 5 under episode 354. The Register reported in a recent update from Stack Counter using data from the end of September 2024, Windows 10 had a 62.79% market share, and Windows 11 accounted for 33.37%, which is an increase over the last few months, but is still a little disappointing. For comparison, in September of 2023, Stack Counter put Windows 11 at just 23.64%, with Windows 10 at 71.62%. So you can see how the gap is certainly closing. But for further comparison, if you look at where things sat at this time in this point of Windows 7's end of life, Windows 10 was comfortably ahead of Windows 7 at that time in terms of market share, with Windows 10 already at 53.18% compared to the 35.05% of Windows 7. So a major difference and hopefully organizations start to get on top of their Windows 11 migration because we're almost at that 12 month mark before end of support for Windows 10. It has been a long time coming, but October 1st marks the availability of Windows 11 Enterprise LTSC 2024. The features in the Windows 11 Enterprise LTSC 2024 are similar to those that are in Windows 11 version 24H2 that I've already listed. And that includes things like the Wi-Fi 7 support, Bluetooth low energy support, sudo for Windows, and more. So it is basically kind of building off of that 24H2. But yeah, this is great news because LTSC is an option that people have been wanting, and now it's here. This week, Microsoft also took the opportunity to unveil some of the Windows 11 AI features they plan to make available over the holiday season. This includes a click to do feature, which is a new AI overlay that's available at any time by holding down the Windows key and clicking with your mouse. It's an overlay that will appear and offer contextual actions based on what's currently on the screen. Similar to the circle to search on Android, according to windowscentral.com. Windows Search itself will also be enhanced with AI to make it more accurate and more useful because <laughs> let's face it, Windows Search in the OS right now can be a bit of a pain in the butt. But also, you'll soon be able to upscale images using AI in the Photos app. And as covered on a previous episode of the podcast, you'll be able to add or remove objects from images using AI and Paint in the updates that are coming in the next few months. There have been reports from Windows 11 users experiencing multiple reboots and blue screens of death after installing an optional preview update KB5043145 on Windows 11. Users experienced a prompt from the automatic repair tool on reboot, and there were even a few cases where BitLocker recovery was also triggered. Even though it was an issue only for those with an optional non-security related preview update installed, Microsoft has made the move to issue a known issue rollback. 
Citrix have released a new Citrix KB article, CTX 691784, warning that with Windows 11 version 24H2, which obviously just launched, as I said, session launches may fail when the anti-key logging feature of app protection is enabled. Citrix say they are working on this as a high priority hotfix for Citrix workspace app, LTSR, and current release. And at this time, it's recommended that the rollouts of Windows 11 24H2 updates and user devices be paused if that anti-key logging policy is enabled. So keep an eye out for a hotfix that should be coming soon as a more permanent fix. Multiple outlets have reported that Microsoft has discontinued HoloLens 2 and there are no plans for a new version. Microsoft has been telling its partners that if they intend to implement HoloLens in their businesses, they need to buy the $3,500 devices now. The current stock of HoloLens 2 headsets is the end of the line, and manufacturing has now ended, according to ExtremeTech.com. Microsoft intends to continue supporting HoloLens 2 until the end of 2027, so there is a little bit of life. However, obviously the stock of the HoloLens devices is going to become quickly depleted as no new stock is going to be available. Microsoft has now done an about face once again with their controversial recall feature, which is the timeline of all activity on Windows machines that's going to be introduced. Recall can now be removed entirely from a system using the optional feature settings in Windows. So if you haven't been following this saga and you don't listen to the podcast regularly, there's a lot of uh, controversy and backlash from security minded folks in the community. They were concerned that this seemed to be on by default and there was no way to remove it. And then Microsoft had let it slip that they were going to make it opt in and it was going to be opt out by default. And then it looked like from a preview that you would have the ability to remove it. But then <laughs> there was also reports suggesting that Microsoft had made a mistake in the preview and really you should not be able to remove it, just opt in or opt out. And now it seems like you're going to be able to remove the feature as part of an optional feature. So it's just been this ongoing saga. Microsoft also shared some other information regarding changes made to recall. Aristanctica reports that all recall data will be stored locally, which isn't new, but it also includes all snapshots and any associated information in the vector database. And this will be encrypted at rest with keys stored in your system's TPM. Recall will only function when BitLocker or device encryption is fully enabled. Recall will also require virtualization-based security and hypervisor-protected code integrity enabled. And these are features that people sometimes turn off to improve like performance in gaming, for example. So if you do that, you'll want to have those enabled if you want to use recall. There will be further security around the data in recall where only code signed by Microsoft will be able to run within the recall data enclaves. So essentially to kind of work within the same space as that recall data, the code will need to be signed. Every time a user pulls up recall to look through their snapshots, they'll need to use Windows Hello to re-authenticate and when they set it up, they will need to use biometric authentication like a face scanning camera or fingerprint reader first. Unlocking recall with the Windows Hello can also be configured after recall has already been turned on, and it's intended as a fallback method meant to avoid data loss if a secure sensor gets damaged. Windows Hello only briefly decrypts recall information according to Ars Technica, and that's when users are actually accessing it. And users will need to reauthorize periodically after a timeout period or in between recall sessions. The encryption keys used to decrypt recall data are cryptographically bound to the identity of the end user, sealed by a key derived from the TPM of the hardware platform, which should close the original recall's most gaping hole which is the ability of another user on a PC being able to easily navigate to a folder in Windows Explorer and see everything stored by recall. So it seems like Microsoft, you know, kind of took their beating, they licked their wounds and they made some improvements before making this revamped recall available. And the good news is it looks like it's going to be an optional feature too. So they definitely listened to the feedback. So kudos to Microsoft. Show sponsor and my employer, Numescent, just released the latest version of the cloud paging player, which is version 9.5, and it brings some pretty significant improvements, including the fact that after you update to this version, in future, there will be fewer reboots 
required in order to update the player. And this is because of significant changes made to the actual coding of the player itself. The cloud paging player filter driver has been modified to eliminate the need for desktop reboots for those future updates, meaning you can dynamically upgrade player in the same way that you can dynamically update applications on the end user's desktops with cloud paging containers themselves. So greatly streamlining things and reducing the need for disruptive downtimes or reboots for player upgrades. The installation of Player is also greatly enhanced. The newest version of the installer is just 5 megabytes in size compared to previous versions that were 20 megabytes or so in size. So a significant decrease in the size and the installations themselves as a result are now three times faster than before. There have also been some significant performance improvements when paging multiple applications at once and other fixes and improvements included too. So if you are a Numescent cloud paging customer or cloud pager customer, you'll want to get to this version as soon as you can. Microsoft has released a new version of Power Toys, version 0.85. So it's creeping ever closer to that first 1.0 release. Uh, with it, the biggest new feature is the new plus or new utility as it's being called, which allows setting a personalized set of templates to quickly create files and folders from a file explorer context menu when using Power Toys. It's also now possible to select which UI language should be used by Power Toys utilities, and there are a lot of quality fixes too. Mozilla has released Firefox version 131. And with this version, users can grant temporary permissions for websites. So for example, if you want to allow notifications from a certain page for a limited period, you can do that. And according to Mozilla, a temporary permission is valid for one hour, after which Firefox automatically clears all the granted permissions. So that's pretty cool. You can also now hover the cursor over a tab strip to preview open pages without switching between them, which is nice too. BleepyComputer.com has reported that the Data Protection Commission in Ireland has fined Meta 91 million euros, or about $100 million, for storing in plain text passwords of hundreds of millions of users. The incident reportedly occurred in 2019. At the time, Meta disclosed it publicly and notified the DPC, which initiated an investigation into their practices for storing sensitive user data. In the 2019 disclosure, Meta had said that it had found some user passwords stored on its systems in a readable format during a routine security review at the beginning of the year. Although the company did not say how many users were impacted, it estimated that it would notify hundreds of millions of Facebook Lite users, tens of millions of other Facebook users, and millions of Instagram users. It's worth noting that the passwords were not available to external parties, and the review found no evidence of abuse or improper access, so it seems like it was an internal fumble on the part of Facebook and Meta and Instagram. AT&T shared more details on the price increase and renewal issues that they had encountered with Broadcom, stating that there was a proposed annual increase of over 1,000% in one year, which they say is extreme and certainly not how they expected strategic partners to engage in doing business with AT&T. Ars Technica stated this claim by AT&T is the highest increase that they've heard about from a VMware customer that is facing renewal. AT&T currently estimates that it will take a period of years to transition all of its servers currently operating with the VMware software away from VMware. And as part of their lawsuit, they claim the defendants have not made it easy to do so, suggesting they are preventing some vendors from selling certain products to AT&T. Regardless of the cost and time it will take for AT&T to migrate off VMware, they say the price increase is still enough to drive them away. So a 1,050% increase in one year is really extreme. That's putting it lightly. I wonder if anyone else can beat that for their renewal. U.S. federal prosecutors have charged a man for an alleged hacked trade scheme, as they're calling it, that earned him millions of dollars by breaking into Office 365 accounts of executives at publicly traded companies and obtaining their quarterly financial reports before they were released to the public. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission filed a civil lawsuit against the hacker seeking an order that he pay civil penalties and return all ill-gotten gains. And there's also a pending separate criminal case. By obtaining material information, they say the attacker was able to predict how a company's stock would perform once it became public. When results were likely to drive down stock prices, 
he would place put options, which gave the purchaser the right to sell shares at a specific price within a specified span of time. Prosecutors charged the man with one count of each securities fraud and wire fraud and five counts of computer fraud. The securities fraud count carries a maximum penalty of up to 20 years prison time and $5 million in fines. And the wire fraud count carries a maximum penalty of up to 20 years in prison and a fine of either $250,000 or twice the gain or loss from the offense, whichever one is greatest. Each computer fraud count carries a maximum five years in prison and a maximum fine of $250,000 or twice the gain or loss from the offense, again, whichever one is greatest. So a little bit of uh, insider trading, but through ill-gotten gains. Obviously, email being in Office 365 makes it a prime target for attackers. And this attacker certainly got his reward in the form of money. But it sounds like he's probably going to lose all of that money and then some and spend some time in prison. But now this episode, scripts, tricks and tips. First tip this week comes from Guy Leach, who shared a one liner to get the download speed in megabytes per second for a file. Now, I'm not going to read it out because it's using regex. I mean, a regular PowerShell commandlet that's long is bad enough to read, let alone one that's got a regex. But I'll share it with this episode, which again, you can find at fivebytespodcast.com and it's with episode 354. Also this week, I saw that Peter Klapwick shared an issue that he's seen when trying to install applications from the Intune company portal recently, where logs show token failures and users see download pending when they're trying to get some applications. So if you're experiencing that, I'd say check out the blog post. I don't think it provides any uh, fix for it, but it'd be interesting to see if you're having the same problem. And it seems as though Peter has already um, submitted a ticket to Microsoft. So you might be able to work with Tandem if you're facing it too. Uh, Finally, I saw that there's a call for sessions for the awesome festive tech calendar that's going to take place as it always does in December of this year. So if there's a topic that you have, particularly if you can make it Christmas themed, this is a great event to submit a session to and get your contributions in before the end of the year. Well, that's it for this episode of the podcast. I apologize for my voice. There's probably not going to be a video uh, intro for this one again because for some reason I just can't get over this chest infection. But hopefully it's clear enough and we'll be back to business as usual next week.